There were some very early disasters in the 20th century, but Titanic was the first one that uh, made such a worldwide impact. People from the outset could identify with people on board the ship. And this is something that has remained over the years. Titanic stood as a pinnacle of human ingenuity in a time of unbridled optimism. There was great optimism that the age was going to improve. They had uh, such modern things as telephone and automobiles and even airplanes. And how far are these wonderful scientific devices going to take us? Above the wreck, Nortil moves to a haunting location in this story. The submersible is guided to the devastated remains of the forward funnel. A 150-foot funnel once occupied this cavernous hole. What we're passing over now is a huge uh, ventilation uh, system. Titanic had, of course, four funnels uh, connected to the boiler rooms. So what we're looking at here is a, a giant tube in effect. And if we were to pursue it further, we would find ourselves way down in the Titanic's boiler rooms. The massive boilers located deep in the belly of the ship were Titanic's source of power. On the day of the disaster, 24 boilers are feeding Titanic's enormous engines. The ship's speed, 21 and a half knots. That evening, Stoker Frederick Barrett begins his shift. In a few short hours, he will find himself in a pitched battle for survival. Second-class passenger, Lawrence Beasley, fills out a claim form so that he can retrieve his valuables from the purser's safe. Before retiring, Beasley takes in some quiet entertainment. After dinner, Mr. Carter invited all who wished to the saloon, and with the assistance at the piano, he started passengers singing hymns. He was curious to see how many chose hymns dealing with dangers at sea. Second-class passenger, Lawrence Beasley. Two hours before impact, wireless operator Jack Phillips receives a warning from the ship Masaba. Ice report, latitude 42 degrees north to 41 degrees 25 minutes north. Saw much heavy pack ice and great number of large icebergs. Wireless operator, Jack Phillips. Phillips doesn't realize the ice field lies directly in Titanic's path. Rather than report the warning to an officer, he places it on a spike. This simple act dooms Titanic. The warning should have been delivered to second officer Charles Lightoller, who was working on the bridge. The one vital report that came through but which never reached the bridge was received from the Mesaba. That delay proved fatal and was the main cause of the loss of that ship. Second officer, Charles Lightoller.
With the stage now set for disaster, the Nortil approaches an eerie scene. We are hovering over the fallen forward mast, and you see the, the remains of the crow's nest. It was here that uh, Lookout Frederick Fleet uh, spotted an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on the night of April 14th, 1912. Fleet used the, uh, the crow's nest bell, but he, he essentially telephoned the bridge to report iceberg dead ahead. The iceberg is spotted a quarter mile away, not enough distance to turn a ship that stretches four city blocks long. Officers steered Titanic from this location. The ship's wheel used to be attached to this device, called a telemotor. It is all that's left of the bridge. What we're seeing is the telemotor coming up. Here is really where Frederick Fleet's order was translated into action. Between Frederick Fleet's warning of the berg and the collision, there was just 37 seconds of time. As Titanic begins to turn, it looks as if the ship will clear the iceberg. But an underwater ledge pierces Titanic's steel hull, buckling plates, causing thin separations in her side. There came what seemed to me nothing more than an extra heave of the engines. Nothing more than that. No sound of a crash or anything else. No sense of shock, no jar that felt like one heavy body meeting another. Second class passenger, Lawrence Beasley. I was just about ready for the land of Nod when I felt a sudden vibrating jar run through the ship. Not that it was by any means a violent concussion, but just a distinct and unpleasant break in the monotony of her motion. Second officer, Charles Lightoller. Deep below in third class, the impact is more obvious to the Lindells. And August Wennerstrom. Captain Smith dispatches Titanic designer Thomas Andrews to inspect the damage to the ship. What Andrews sees is devastating. He reports to Captain Smith that Titanic is filling fast. A quick calculation reveals the ship has an hour, maybe two. Andrews realizes the deadly implications immediately. On board are more than 2,000 passengers and crew, but only enough lifeboats for just half of them. Following the collision, the ship is quiet again. Most first and second class passengers are still sleeping. Little do they realize, a drama unfolds in the bow of the ship. Deep below, the front of Titanic is quickly flooding. The forward crew must abandon their positions. For the time being, Titanic's electricity is holding. Stoker Barrett and several others attempt to keep the water out of boiler room five. The men attach long hoses to the pumps. If they keep this section from flooding, they believe they can save the ship. They do not know that Titanic's designer has already declared her doomed. <laughs> 